Um, Second Timothy. So this is our first week in this letter. And in February 2005, I came home from work uh, and there was a letter, a handwritten letter to me. And as I began to read it, I came to realize that it was a letter of goodbye from one of my spiritual mentors. I've mentioned Professor David Short in this place uh, before on a number of occasions because he and his wife Joan had such an effect on Wendy and I as we spent a couple of years in Aberdeen right at the start of our marriage. But in this letter, it was brief, he mentioned that he had been diagnosed with acute leukemia and in consultation with his haematologist had decided not to have any treatment. He explained that this now meant he could eat as much butter as he wanted. But more seriously, he then went on to attest to God's faithfulness to him and also to encourage me in my uh, occupation as a doctor uh, and also in my Christian walk. His closing remark in that letter was a request that I pray for him that he would finish well. His concern was that in his final months that Jesus would continue to be glorified in his life. And the letter that we're going to be looking at over these next few weeks eh, similar in that Paul, the Apostle Paul, faced imminent death. It wasn't a natural death, it would be execution at the hands of Emperor Nero in around AD 66. But just like David Short, Paul's main concern was that Jesus would continue to be glorified. And for him, that was specifically that the gospel would be guarded the good news that human beings are saved by faith alone, great, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The gospel was of first importance to Paul. First letter that we have from Paul is the letter to the Galatians where he urges them not to turn to a different gospel, a Jesus plus works gospel, and here again in his final letter recorded for us, his concern is for the gospel. He urges Timothy to guard the gospel, whatever the personal cost may be. Now we've had the first 12 verses read to us already, and you will have noticed that there is, with all letters, as with all letters, a writer and a recipient. The writer is Paul, who, as you know, was Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of Christians until he met the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, that Damascus road experience. And that event and the task that the Lord Jesus then gave to him meant that he could identify himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He had both seen the risen Lord Jesus and had a personal mission or sending out by Jesus. Those two events qualified him as an apostle, a witness to the resurrection and a personal commission from Jesus. That commission was to take the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, the gospel, to the Gentiles. And the narrative of the, the book of the Acts, Wendy alluded to some of that, made it very clear that that commission for Paul was going to be arduous, challenging, and uh, costly for him in a physical sense. He went on at least three missionary journeys, planting churches as he went. He was beaten physically, he was stoned, it says he was shipwrecked three times, so I'll have, Wendy suggested two. We'll have a discussion about that at lunch. He was rejected by his fellow Jews 
and deserted by his friends. And we have 13 letters in the New Testament recorded from Paul. And it tell, that tells us a lot too about his care, his pastoral concern, and his ongoing commitment to the Christians in these churches, praying that they would hold onto the truth of the gospel and live lives worthy of their calling to follow Jesus. Paul is a writer, Timothy is the recipient. We've already read that Paul describes Timothy as his dear son. Timothy was brought up in Lystra, which is just in here. Uh, and you can see these are the missionary journeys uh, in different colors here. So on the first missionary journey, Paul visited Lystra and on the second missionary journey with Silas, by the time he got to Lystra, Timothy is described as a disciple uh, and also that the brothers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, is what it says in Acts 14. We know that his father was Greek and that his mum was a Jewess and a believer. And as Paul moved on from Lystra, Timothy went with him. He was a companion of Paul eh, on the majority of that second missionary journey and on the third missionary journey. We also read in Acts that Paul sent Timothy out as a delegate to Thessalonica and to Corinth on special missions. Timothy was also present with Paul when he was arrested the first time and in prison in Rome. The letters to Philippians, uh, Colossians and Philemon tell us that. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. That's why he called him his dear son. But he was more than just a son. He was a fellow worker with Paul. And Timothy was sent as a leader and worker to Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was where Paul had spent most of his time, or most time with, in a sense, uh, of all the churches that were planted, about three years. So when Paul says he has no one else like him, alluding to, Tim to Timothy, he clearly trusted Timothy to carry on the ministry that he, Paul, had invested so much in. There are a number of other things that we know about Timothy that we can glean from these first few verses of this second letter, which can be added to from the first letter that was written to Timothy. Firstly, he had a, a godly upbringing. Verse in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy makes it clear that from infancy, Timothy had been taught the scriptures and verse 5 of today's reading, which is up there, informs us that his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois were believers. They were Christians. Timothy obviously had been taught the Old Testament because that was all that was available, but had come to know personally, that as we read later in the letter, that these words were able to make you wise for salvation through faith. In Christ Jesus. Those of us who were privileged to be at Ingrid's baptism just a few weeks ago heard that she knew a lot about God, she knew a lot about Jesus, she knew a lot about the Bible, but she realized that head knowledge wasn't enough. She needed to decide if she truly believed that she needed to believe that Jesus died for her sins. She needed to repent and seek forgiveness for herself because the sincere faith of Tim and Katrina, her mum and dad, wasn't inherited or transferable. It had to be her own. So too for Timothy, as Paul reminds us in verse 5, I've been reminded of your sincere faith. The faith of Lois and Eunice was 
A good example for Timothy, the importance of God's word in their lives was passed on to him, but only Timothy could take that step of faith. Jim and I have been fortunate to have parents who love Jesus and who love God's word. And for those of us who are parents, it is important for us to encourage our children to get to know God's word because they're bombarded by stuff from the media and from the peers that is less than helpful and sometimes just dangerous. God's word is true and he gave it to us as food for our spiritual lives. And if we don't feed on it, we become spiritually malnourished and far more susceptible and vulnerable to the false teaching of our day, which, as we'll hear over the next few weeks, isn't a million miles away from the false teaching of Timothy's day. So while Timothy had a good spiritual upbringing, Paul's first letter to Timothy suggests that he wasn't particularly physically robust. He's encouraged, be strong. There's that sense of being timid or shy uh, as Paul exhorts him to be strong there uh, and talks about that spirit of timidity. He also uh, physically was a bit uh, weak too. This is one of my dad's favorite verses, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses as he asks for another glass of red wine, which is, a bit, I suppose, a bit uh, controversial for a liver doctor um, to be encouraging these things. Don't look anyone, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young has already been alluded to uh, by Drew. Timothy was probably in his 30s, which for the culture was very young to be in a position of responsibility. Uh, but there's no doubt that Paul himself didn't think that too young because verse 6, as we read earlier, tells us that Paul himself ordained or commissioned Timothy into ministry by the laying on of his hands. The gift, probably preaching or evangelism, as we'll find out in these later chapters, uh, Paul exhorts him to stir it up, not to neglect it. Uh, as he mentions in his first letter, don't neglect this gift. Continue to fan it by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in him and through him in Ephesus. Notice Paul doesn't say it's just going to happen where Timothy has to work at it. He, he needs to apply himself to keep fanning into flame that spirit, something, as Wendy's reminded us, that we all need to do. So we know who the writer is, a bit more about the recipient. But what does this letter written nearly 2,000 years ago to a young church leader in Ephesus have to say to us in Fernie Hill this morning. And as we uh, look at verses 8 to 12, I think there are three points that I want to make that would be an encouragement to us here uh, in Fernie Hill as they were to Timothy. Firstly, God's grace is eternal. Uh, it was great to sing those songs about grace. God's grace is eternal and has a name, Jesus. Being a Christian isn't easy, but he is worth it. And don't be ashamed of the gospel. It saves lives. Firstly, God's grace is eternal and has a name. He has saved us called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, 
Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. A couple of Sundays ago, Ian, Wendy and myself were chatting about books. And I think Ian asked the question about what were the three most influential Christian books that Wendy and I had read. Not straightforward, but one that I identified was What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. I don't know if you've read that great book. In it, Yancey describes grace as the last best word, a word that hasn't really been perverted by pervading culture or language creep. God's undeserving favor that has been intertwined into our world by a loving God so that the pleasure that you get um, rounding a bend and seeing the magnificent Scottish hills or a white beach and uh, blue sea, that unexpected intake of breath moment, you know, that just boosts your inner self, unexpected, uh, undeserved. We are designed to appreciate grace because it speaks of a gracious God. As a lot of you will know, some of my favorite verses are the first 18 verses of John's gospel, best prose ever written. And in that, we learn that Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. And when Joe Stoll expounded on these verses in Keswick a number of years ago, I remember him saying that the, the, the Greek, the original Greek, really isn't grace and truth. It's grace upon grace. Jesus is full of grace upon grace. He is the personification of grace. So much so that in Paul's letter to Titus, he writes, For the grace of God has appeared Jesus has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Every human being apart from Jesus has chosen to follow their own way. The Bible calls that sin. And Romans 3.23 reminds us that the wages of sin is death. By working for ourselves, in a sense, Uh, The ages, the wages that we receive following our selfish desires, we get our deserved wages. Uh, Death and separation from God. But Paul reminds Timothy, Jesus has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus died on the cross paying our debt and in rising again destroyed death the death that we deserve but the wonder of grace is that we don't get what we do deserve but we also get a gift as well we get real life life that will go on forever because we become part of God's family he adopts us as his children, grace upon grace. In the Old Testament, God chose Israel, the children of Israel, not because there was anything lovable about them. He loved them because he loved them, is what it says in Deuteronomy. When Jesus came into our world, we saw that grace in action as he demonstrated his love for us by dying. God's eternal grace is personified in Jesus. Timothy knew that, and I hope that you know that and believe that this morning. But being a Christian isn't easy in many respects. The more active you are in your faith, the more challenging it may become. That was Paul's experience. Verses 11 and 12 of this gospel. I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Earlier on, we read too in verse 8, 
says to Timothy, it's something to be expected. Join with me, he says, in suffering for the gospel. And later on in this letter, Paul will say, everyone who wants to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If we're serious about our faith and want to live a holy life, as Paul reminds Timothy, then we're, it's likely that we will be persecuted. And it shouldn't surprise us. The perfect son of God lived a perfectly holy life, which was just too much for those around them. And they crucified him. Jesus offended those around him because he challenged their view of God. He pointed to a God who was more interested in a heart responding to grace and showing grace to those around him than a life bound by laws and regulations. And for us, the gospel continues to offend people today. The idea or the truth that someone would have to die for them because of their imperfect life is offensive. And grace itself, which says, there's nothing that I can do will make Jesus love me more. There's nothing I can do that will make him love me less. That idea, that truth is offensive to an individualistic, self-sufficient society that we live in. I remember Paul Mayo, when we were away at Oak Hall, mentioning uh, you know, a conversation that he'd had with one of his non-Christian friends where he was explaining you know, the, the amazing uh, forgiveness that God had shown to a prisoner who'd been convicted of murder when his, and his friend was absolutely offended that God could forgive someone who had murdered someone else. You know, grace is offensive to the society that we live in. And last week we heard some real life, real challenging stories about Christians who were willing to die for their faith. And I remember um, when we had a visit from Derek about the murders in Malacca where two Turkish believers and uh, German missionaries were murdered and we, we were being told about the trials of that the, those perpetrators recounted that just before they died the, the Turkish believers what was on their mouth was the word of Jesus you know in those horrific moments Jesus was enough for them he was worth it so while the Christian life may not be easy Jesus is definitely worth it. Finally, Paul encourages Timothy not to be ashamed of the gospel. Paul is facing death because of it. But he declares, yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And in verse 8, he says to Timothy, don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or, a she, or me, his prisoner. Paul may have been getting some bad press in, in Ephesus. God's people get bad press frequently in our society, but we're called both not to be ashamed of the gospel or of God's people. When I was at school, I wore a badge on my blazer uh, saying, Jesus saves. And I had uh, varied responses to that. Um, the PE teacher would say, um, so say, oh, Jesus saves. But Keegan nets the rebound. <laughs> the, the shopkeeper, who I knew pretty well, um, I remember her bending over just to read my badges and say, Jesus saves. And there was a, a, a mocking sneer that 
came onto her face that really took my breath away, that was uh, quite upsetting for a, a time. But there were another time I remember coming back from a, a sevens tournament that we'd been playing in the borders uh, and had our blazers on and one of uh, my, my uh, teammates read the badge and said, what, do, what does Jesus save us from? And then followed a conversation about faith. And these were the type of responses that uh, Paul got as well. There were people who just laughed. There were people who were disinterested. Uh, there were people who were aggressive. Uh, and there were people who were engaged. I don't wear that badge anymore. I'm not even sure where it is. Am I ashamed of the gospel? Am I more concerned that people will think I'm a bit strange or even crazy believing that a man dying on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago is the most significant event in history? Am I more concerned about what they think than the fact that they are spiritually dead and heading for a lost eternity? I need to be more like Paul who wrote to the Corinthians saying, we are fools for the sake of Jesus Christ and not be concerned what others might think. Paul certainly wasn't concerned. I suspect that some of us may have heard this story about the, the Christian uh, who met up with a close friend from university some 20 years after finishing studying. Uh, uh, and his friend had become a Christian. Uh, and when they met, he thought, oh, I'm a, I'm a bit of my pal, he's a Christian now. It'll be great to see him. But when he met him, his friend was extremely upset with him. And he said, you knew that Jesus was the answer and the gospel was true back then, but you never told me. I thought you were my friend, but you weren't even prepared to tell me there was a heaven and a hell. You know, every time I think about that story, I am challenged in my own life. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It saves lives. Paul encourages Timothy to be prepared to testify about Jesus. And as Wendy's already said in verse 7, Paul encourages Timothy with the words, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. God's Spirit is within us and His power is available to us to be bold in our witness to God's amazing grace in the Lord Jesus. But just as a house or a balloon, as Wendy was uh, illustrating, a house will remain in darkness unless the power is switched on, allowing the lights to, to work, so too we will be ineffective or even silent in our witness unless we ask God to release the Spirit's power in our lives. At our home groups this week, Katrina was reminding us that we often forget to ask God for things so we don't receive. Let's ask God that his Spirit will empower us to have opportunity this week to share the gospel with someone. What a challenge that is for me that each morning as I spend time in God's word and prayer that uh, he will empower me through his spirit and he will give me opportunity to share the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It saves lives. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for your word as we've uh, remember that Timothy was brought up learning it 
we've been challenged that just learning it doesn't mean that we're right with you. The gospel needs to enter into our lives. The Lord Jesus, the one who demonstrates your eternal grace, needs to become real to us as it did, as he did to Timothy. Father, we want to thank you for the gospel. We want to thank you for the Lord Jesus. He is worthy of our praise. He is worth the cost. And Father, as we serve you in a society that often completely disregards you, Father, help us to ask for your spirit to embolden us as we seek to live for you with power, as we seek to demonstrate your grace in our lives and as we seek to testify to the wonder of what the Lord Jesus has done. Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.